This is a very special segment on the Beatlemaniacs, our very first interview with someone other than the four hosts. And my guest today is Katie from TikTok. If you don't know who Katie from TikTok is, she has a very special distinction. She actually stayed at the childhood home of George Harrison, 25 Upton Green, as a matter of fact. And she's also a songwriter and has a tremendous voice and really nice composing skills. And we're going to interview her after I show you this video. Let me tell you a little bit about my time staying in George Harrison's childhood home. I was able to stay in 25 Upton Green, where George spent his life from about the age of six to about the age of 20. George learned to play the guitar in this house, and the Beatles had a lot of their early rehearsals here. George heard the Beatles on the radio for the first time in this house, and he met Paul while living in this area, taking the bus to school. It was so special for me to be in a place that had so much significance to George and his life, and it was so incredible to try and step into his shoes a little bit too. There are a lot of details in the house that make it similar to when George lived there, like having a guitar and a record player, as well as having the pink rose wallpaper and the pink rose couch that we see in the background of so many pictures taken in this house. It was so meaningful to get the chance to celebrate George and his history in that house, especially since neither of his childhood homes are museums like John and Paul's are. I'll be sure to talk a little bit more about the house and share more pictures in future videos, as well as talk about how you could maybe stay there one day if you'd like. Hello, Katie. How Hi. are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm really well. I met you. We encountered each other on TikTok, which is very novel. Um, well, Katie, you fascinated me because you are a Beatle maniac. Well, I do yes. a podcast called The Beatle Maniacs, and you are a Beatles fan, and you are, I would say, a generation or two younger than me. And you stayed at George Harrison's childhood home. And I, yes. the first thing I saw was your video describing it. Can you describe that experience for me? Yes, yeah. I'll mention a little bit about how I found out about it. Um, I knew I was going to Liverpool. I just recently graduated from college. And so I was like to celebrate. I'm going to I'm going to take the journey, take the pilgrimage to Liverpool. And I had heard earlier this year that George's childhood home, 25 Upton Green, was up for auction. And so I was kind of keeping an eye on it, see what was going to happen. Um, and it seemed like an American fan bought it not really expecting to win possibly. Um, and so it seems like he wasn't quite sure what to do with it. And he said, well, I'll turn it into an Airbnb. And so I was curious to see, you know, was it gonna become a museum? Was it gonna be like given to the National Trust or is it gonna become a private residence where nobody will ever get to see inside of it, you know, unless you are the person living there. So I was really excited to see that it was gonna become a place where you could not only just visit, but you could stay there overnight and really have a very like private experience in George's home. And so I took the leap and I stayed there for two nights um, in June and it was such a great experience. It's um, in Speak, so it's about 50 minutes um, outside of like downtown Liverpool. Um, so you have to take like the bus here and there, but I enjoyed that because that's where George and Paul met. And so on the bus to and from Liverpool and Speak. And so I love to just kind of think about their conversations and their budding friendship, what they might have talked about. Um, I loved all the little details they put in the house to kind of help you imagine like what different rooms George may have been doing what in like they put Chuck Berry and Carl Perkins posters on like the bedroom that would have been his and his brothers and so um, you can kind of tell who would have been where and they have a record player and a guitar and so um, it was a great experience to to really just sit and you know after going to all of the other places in Liverpool all of the the big attractions like Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields. It was really cool to to come back at the end of the day and just sit and think about it. And, you know, George's 
life there from about the age of six to about the age of 20. And so it was, it was such a, a cool experience. I was, I would recommend it to, to anybody thinking of doing it. It was definitely worth it. Well, England is on my agenda at some point, And I definitely, I think I will consider that very strongly if, if I do get to go. Now, how did you become such a knowledgeable Beatles fan or a Beatles fan in general? I don't imagine any of your friends when you were going to school were into it. They must have looked at you like kind of like that. Yeah, well, I'm actually, I took a, a class in college called The Beatles, um, and I'd always been, you know, a little bit interested in them, I, but I wasn't like a diehard fan, but I was like, it would be really cool to, to learn a bit more about them and, you know, some of the music I knew, and then from there, I just completely fell in love with the story, and I fell in love with George, especially, I think, you know, like a lot of people, I think there's like that member of a band that really gets you into them. And since George isn't talked about as much, I didn't really know much about him for most of my life. And then taking that class, I really got to see him a little bit better. And then I was like, okay, that's my entry into this group. George is my person in that group. And um, yeah, that it was, it was really crazy to take a class. And that really just kind of totally changed my direction in life and um, a new lifelong love as well. That's very interesting. Now your other passion and you name your TikTok channel after is Harry, what's his last name? Sh St Styles. Styles, Harry Styles. So I went back and researched for this program. I went and listened to Harry Styles, got a nice voice. I, I didn't know he was a member of One Direction. I found that out. I've, I had heard of that group. I have never heard them. So, you know, we, we kind of get segregated sometimes with our generations and it's good to get out of that. And my favorite of contemporary artists is Lana Del Rey. What do you think of Lana Del Rey? She worked with uh, Sean Lennon not too long ago. Yeah, I think she's really cool. I think it has been really interesting to see how different generations of musicians are starting to kind of like interact with each other. And again, like fan bases of different, you know, people like people who were at the Cavern Club in the early days, you know, being alongside young kids who are just hearing like Yellow Submarine for the first time. It's really cool to kind of see this overlap of different generations enjoying the same music and loving it, you know, and um, yeah, or like Paul McCartney and that interview he did. Um, he interviewed Harry Styles once. He also did that interview with Taylor Swift once, you know, so it's been cool to kind of see how um, different generations, because there are so many similarities, you know, like when you think about like what a boy band was back then and what a boy band is today, you know, it's, it's really cool to, to see those overlap. And yeah, Lana's a really cool artist. She's somebody who it's so hard to like think of somebody else who's like her. She's just so unique and she has her niche so well carved out. And so, yeah, I think she's a really interesting songwriter. Now you were obviously a fan of Harry before you were a fan of the Beatles and George, correct? Yes. Yes. I've been a fan of Harry since about 2011. So a bit of a longer love for me. So here's my Beatles story. So I grew up here in, north of Boston, Massachusetts in a small town called Revere, a little suburb. And the Beatles came through here when I was nine years old. And my friend Charlie had Beatles tickets. And you're gonna be very disappointed in me in, in a second. He <laughs> holds the tickets in front of me and I'm a little boy of eight years old. Do you wanna go see the Beatles? I said, no, girls scream for them. I don't like that. So. The, the boy band idea was over the my yes. curiosity into who they were. I had seen them on television, but they came through. We have a place called Suffolk Downs that used to be a, a dog racing track. And they were here probably for a half an hour. You couldn't really hear them or hardly see them anyway because of the crowd. You know, all the legends, you know, they couldn't even hear themselves. And uh, so, you know, that to my everlasting regret, I did not become a Beatles fan, believe it or not until I was in college uh, because I had that little prejudice against boy bands or, you know, little boys hate little girls. And that <laughs> it took me some maturing to get into the music. The first albums I bought were the White Album 
and and uh, Abbey Road. I went backwards from the late to the early, and then there was no stopping me. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's definitely interesting to hear. I think when I started to get into them, I think for most of my life, I was like, oh, people who like the Beatles are typically like older generations and typically like men. And so it was really interesting to look back though and go, wait, when they were together, especially in the beginning, most of their audience was young women. And so it is kind of funny to, to kind of have the flip side and be like, oh, I'm actually quite close to what their target audience was back in the day. But today I feel like, yeah, you know, the people who write books about the Beatles, most of them are like older men. And so it is kind of interesting to see too how that's shifting a little bit and those conversations are happening. But, um, but that's really cool. It's cool. Maybe college is a good age to get into the Beatles. Maybe that's the, the common thread well, to here. To get into every, anything, I think college opens your mind. You know, the people yeah. kind of diss college because they'll think of it as the wrong thing. Oh, it's going to help me get a good job. But the way to think of it is just meeting different people of all religions and creeds and nationalities and great books. Like I discovered Dostoevsky, the Russian author. When I was in college, I became obsessed with him. And uh, it's just a great place to discover yourself, I think, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So now you're going to, this is, this is funny. This is a coincidence now. So when I, after I got into them in 74, I started to play the guitar. My friend who still lives three houses away from me, believe it or not, we still wow. live, live on the same street. We started a band and guess what my band's name was? I don't know. Apple Scruffs was our band name. There you go. <laughs> and everybody gave us, nobody knew what the heck is an apple scruff, you know? Of course, I had the definition wrong myself. The real literal definition would be a, a female groupies kind of thing, right? Yeah, so the apple scruffs were, yeah, a group of mostly women. I think there was maybe one or two men as well who were, um, yeah, in their like early 20s who would wait outside the Beatles typically at the Apple offices or like Abbey Road Studios. So wherever they were recording, like most of, some of them had day jobs, some of them didn't. Like they would just, their lives were waiting outside the steps to see the Beatles whenever they would come in or leave. And that was kind of what they did. Um, I think I've heard them say they didn't describe themselves as groupies. Like they weren't really interested in like trying to hook up with the Beatles yeah. or anything, but they just... Some of them developed like a lot of friendships with them. One of them wrote a book, which I really loved, Carol Bedford. Um, and I've heard that some of the Apple Scruffs don't like that. Like sometimes they like to keep their stories with the Beatles like private. Um, but I love, I love George's thought about Apple Scruffs. Yeah, I do have an Apple Scruffs tattoo. I have a podcast with um, two other people named Apple scruff. So I just, I, I love whenever somebody asks like, what's an apple scruff? Cause it gets like, well, let me tell you. <laughs> See that crosses generations too. What's an apple scruff? <laughs> yeah. Nobody knows. <laughs> to me, it was just a Beatles fan. And I thought it was a cool, we, we were Beatles fans. So we call ourselves apple scruffs. So I, I played lefty bass. I arranged oh. the vocals and uh, we weren't that, you know, we didn't practice enough. We didn't practice like once a week, you know, we played a few gigs and that's how I found out that I really didn't want the musician's life. It is tough because when you don't have roadies, you're carrying these big PA systems and amplifiers and guitars. You don't get out of the club until like two or three in the morning and then you're exhausted. You're ruined for the next day. It's like no wonder these people have substance abuse problems. <laughs> energy, energy. Yeah. So I want to address your haircut because I watched your early, early TikToks and you have long hair and now you have a haircut that's very reminiscent of early Beatles. Is that by design? It absolutely was. Yeah, I think about two years ago, I went, I, just, I love George's hair and like get back that era. I just love his haircut. And so I was like, I want to look like that. And so I took, those were my reference pictures going to get my haircut. And I was like, can you make me look like this? And she was like, okay. And so 
yeah, I've had it for a while now. And I really, now this just feels like, oh yeah, this is me and this is my, my little shag. I, I love it. <laughs> it's very interesting because I think you smile more now when, with this haircut. Those early videos, maybe it's just that you weren't comfortable on video yet. I teach people how to be in front of the camera and uh, you seem very comfortable now. I think that's probably it. It's coincidental that it coincides with the hair, hairdo, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely true. I think when I first got a TikTok too, you know, it was kind of just like, I got it to watch videos. I didn't really think about making them or when I did, it would just kind of be fun or whatever. And then once I did kind of see like, oh, you can post about like for me, like Harry and George to people I love and like such a big part of who I am that I could make videos about that and that those would connect with other people. I think that to me, was just like, oh, TikTok can be this place where I find other people who have this very specific intersection of, I like Harry Styles and I like George Harrison. And I think that also just became a really like lively and exciting place for me. You know, like the two other people I do the Apple Scrubs podcast with, I also met on TikTok and I liked the way that they talked about the Beatles. And now we all are friends and know each other. And it is kind of amazing. And I think that brought a lot of joy to me to kind of see like, oh, TikTok can be a place where you can kind of find your people who otherwise, you know, maybe aren't in your neighborhood or, you know, in your immediate vicinity. And so I think that's just brought me a lot of joy too. That's very interesting. You know, it's amazing. The online community, there's a lot of negativity about being online and the nuts that you meet online. And, but I've had some good experiences. You just got to use common sense. I actually met a, a woman that, um, she has a video company in Brussels, Belgium, and she found out I do voices. So I do voiceover work. So she hired me for like eight months after we were talking. We, we switched from Twitter. I don't know how we met on Twitter. Uh, she made a joke and she thought I was making a joke, but she thought I was making fun of her. We went from Twitter to Facebook and then we stayed on Facebook and we, we would chat like every morning. She'd be going home from work and I'd be going into work. And we would have a little morning chat. And I mentioned I do voices. So she had me, she sent me a video of a guy with a British accent. She said, can you do this guy? So I go, yeah. You know, I, I listened to it. She sends me the script. I used my mic over there and I did the voice, sent it. She paid me on PayPal. What, a, what an amazing thing, you know? Now, wow. if only I could replicate that and expand my, she was my, main client for a long, long time. Now I've been trying to expand. Marketing is a, is a challenge for me. Maybe not for you. You're younger than me. <laughs> no, yeah. Marketing is where with things, things change so often that, that it's weird to kind of, you know, what are the rules? What's the new way to do it? But I'm very jealous. I, I love impressions. I can't, that's not a talent of mine, but people who can do impressions, I'm so jealous of. I think that's especially with the Beatles world. I love seeing people who can do the Liverpudlian accent. And, you know, I love, I love that. I did a comedy skit because I write comedy stuff too. I'm not famous or anything like that. But in my earlier career, I used to do skits with my students. That's what I do. That's what kept me into this world. Um, so somebody got like a Beatle wig and gave it to me. And uh, <laughs> I did a skit about Paul McCartney uh, and I'll have to send it. I'm not going to describe it. I'm going to send it to your email uh, once I find it. And uh, you can give me an honest assessment. But uh, I, I, I wanted it to be accurate. So I found a real interview with Paul McCartney where I wanted to get the Liverpool accent right. And I did it. And, uh, you know, when, when you get it, when you're doing these kind of things, you kind of feel that you're them. And as I was doing it, I could feel it. I was in the zone, you know, when I would do characters and skits like that but a lot of fun yeah. a lot of a lot of fun yeah. a little dated now because it's got linda in it linda is mentioned in it of course this is 1993 i think i did wow you know, probably a little kid <laughs> <laughs> you've got the lefty bass thing too so that must have helped yeah. with it's, getting into character <laughs> it's it's, it's kind of it's kind of it's not crude but it's not i don't know i i don't know if i want to show it to casual fans i don't know it's kind of weird i get that i think you'll laugh I, get that. I think you will laugh and i do the voice 
at the beginning uh, introducing the skit. It's ba- it's it's a fake radio show, oh. a fake. There used to be. Remember Inside Edition? Uh, a like little, little bit. Gossip gossip shows. So um, oh, yes. And there, there was when I when I did the skit, there was a thing called Hard Copy, Inside Edition, Entertainment Tonight. All right, so it's it's mo- modeled after that. So it's supposedly a TV show that you're watching. But enough of me. Back to you. Back to you. I want to talk about your music, and that really excites me. You're a songwriter, and you're a singer, and you have a really, really good delivery and a good voice. And uh, how did you get involved in that, and how did you discover your singing talent? Yeah, well, thank you, first of all. That was very nice. Um, Yeah, I've been singing for a really long time. Like, ever since I was a kid, I just loved to sing. And, you know, um, singing is probably, like, my first love. And then around high school, I think, you know, being a really big One Direction fan and um, really loving Harry really inspired me to get into music. And I think, I think there's also that idea of like, there's certain songs I'd like to hear, but they don't exist. And so it's like, okay, well then go write that song, go make that song. And so, um, yeah, by the time I was done with high school, I was like, that's what I want to do, that's what I want to really hone as a skill. And so I wanted to go study songwriting in college. Um, And there's not many songwriting programs in America, especially like contemporary songwriting. I didn't want to do composing because I was, I wanted to be, you know, like a singer songwriter. Um, And I was really fortunate. I live in Colorado. And so um, I went to the University of Colorado, Denver, and they have a singer songwriter program. And so that was my major. And I loved when people are like, what do you study? I'm like, I'm a singer songwriter major. I loved getting that opportunity to spend like four years really honing that um, with great teachers, a really great community of other songwriters. Um, and yeah, I just graduated from that in May. And so, um, yeah, I've just kind of been around the time I started liking George too. I started writing songs about the Beatles and it kind of felt sometimes you write songs where it's like, this is just for me. Like, I don't think other people, this is so specific. Other people might not really click with it. Um, But then kind of the opposite thing happened where I think a lot of people were like, I really like that song about George, or I liked that song about Paul and Linda, you know, and people, it's such a accessible story, the Beatles, that people actually like um, those iterations of it. And so, um, yeah, I've just kind of started to touch the edge of sharing some of those on TikTok of some of the songs about George I've written um, or, you know, other fandom related things. I really like writing songs about whatever's on my mind. It's really fun to, to turn into that. And so, yeah, I love songwriting. Um, it can, like you said, music can be um, a hard path. It can be a less certain path, um, but there is just so much joy and camaraderie and fun in doing it too and so um yeah I I feel very grateful to have that part of my identity and get to explore it and get to pursue it is is really exciting now do you sing harmony can you do two of us or if I fell I do sing a little harmony um I'm also I'm in a trio with two other girls and that's definitely helped me practice harmonies a little bit more um but yeah I'd love to try to harmonize with myself more often and especially yeah those are some iconic ones to do (laughs) oh it's just it's a real I remember I got my first reel to reel uh long long ago and I kept doing the song because and overdubbing and overdubbing and overdubbing and it's just like when you first hear yourself doing that and then it comes out correctly, it's amazing. You know, yeah. I have about 50 songs that I have, uh, but I'm a musical primitive. I need other people. I make, t- I can't play live. I, it's funny. Cause when I, when I was bass player in Apple Scruffs, I could play all the bass parts. I could sing the backups. When I start singing lead, I don't think I can play and sing at the same time. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed when I see, I just saw Paul in June. Uh, nice. He came to Boston and uh, just amazing that he just no intermissions. Did you see him recently? No, I was, I was disappointed. I didn't see Ringo or Paul cause neither of them quite made their way here. And so, but I know that Ringo now postponed it. I'll have to see 
you know, when he's done that. But yeah, I was like, it's so amazing that two Beatles are touring this year. And so I was disappointed that I didn't get to see either of them. But I've heard, yeah, great things about both tours. They were in Massachusetts at the same time and everybody was kind of looking and seeing if Ringo was going to come in. But no such luck, you know. Now I'm going to tell you my Ringo story. So yeah. In 1989, I saw the first all-star band. And over the line from Massachusetts to New Hampshire, there's a place called the Kingston Fairground where they have the seasonal county fair every year. So my, my friend's friend owned that fairground and he got us backstage passes. So I'm thinking I'm going to meet Ringo. You know, that's what you think of when you think of a backstage pass. But when we went backstage, we saw all this equipment, the boxes for the amps and all the cases that said Ringo on it. And there was like about 100 people with us. There was catered food. But Ringo had a trailer like you could see it, but we didn't see Ringo. So somebody had flowers for Ringo, a lady and a little girl. So the lady said, maybe my little girl can give Ringo the flowers. So my friend that I was with, he said, I know where Ringo's trailer is. He says, I'll bring your daughter to that. Now, today, you wouldn't do that. That's too dangerous, you know, but it was a better climate back then. So he took, I said, I'm staying here. I don't want to miss anything. He went, he met Ringo. She gave him the flowers and shook hands. It didn't get his autograph, but you know, he, he came back and I go, Oh my God, I came that close to meeting Ringo. I was upset, you know, Oh so man. then so flash forward to 30 years or whatever it is, what it was 2016. I met a teacher where I was working who was that little girl that oh my god i don't even know how we managed to talk about it but it's very 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 strange she was wow. the same little girl anyway i gave me goosebumps wow that's crazy yeah but i still didn't get to meet ringo <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, I know it's a thing where it's like, they're both, since we, yeah, they're around, you know, it's like, it would be great to, to have yeah. some sort of moment with them, especially since I love George. It's like, okay, I will never, you know, have a moment with George, obviously, but um, yeah, there's still two left that there's that potential, you know. Now, what do you think of the new number two that uh, George's son, Danny, uh, was a part of for a long time? Oh, um do you mean like as a Danny, as a musician? Danny Harrison was a member of the new number two. Now the new number two is named after a show called The Prisoner in the 60s. And it was about a secret agent who was a prisoner on an island and he could never get off the island. That was the whole series. So he was number two. So Danny Harrison and his band named their band the new number two meaning some secret meaning like they can't get away or whatever it's just like a, it's kind of a coded thing only for fans of that show maybe you know but the first song i ever heard from them just blew me away and i'll have to send, i'll have to send you that if you've never heard heard it it was really really good but he they didn't stay together very long he he's trying a lot of different things wow but, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I am guilty of not listening to as much of Danny's stuff or a lot of the Beatles children. I have it, but I've heard, you know, there's, there's good stuff out there. I mean, yeah, they had great teachers, obviously. And so, yeah, I'd like to, to dive into a little bit more of his well, stuff. You know, it, it's, it's a curse and a blessing for those guys to be the sons of the Beatles or the yeah. daughters of the Beatles. If you're trying to pursue the same avenue, you know, Julian Lennon, took a break from it and he did photography and he just came back with a single but you know you're not going to hear a new come together or a new uh because you're just not you know it, it, it's just lightning doesn't strike twice and i feel so bad for them that when they post their stuff on youtube people oh you're gonna get together with sean and 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 recreate the you know you know audiences that are casually into it they're gonna say ridiculous suggestions like that and it must drive those guys crazy you know because they're, yeah. not, they're not they're not appreciating them for who they are if you can appreciate them for who they are then 
you can enjoy it, you know? Uh-oh. Yeah. My timer, yeah, that shadow. My oh, timer okay. is running out. I might have to restart if we want to continue here. Okay. There's a few more things. Well, we'll wait till it kicks us off. Um, okay. So I want to get it to George since he's your main focus. Now, and I read this recently. I didn't really realize it. I've always known George was the deep one. And I started to get into George more than Paul and John back in All Things Must Pass days because I like the meanings of his songs. My all-time favorite George song is Long, Long, Long. That just blows me away, that song. The arrangement, the writing, the singing, just everything came together. Even the drums are mystical in that in that song. So come to find out later on, you know, if you read about these people, you see interviews with them, George can be a little bit feisty. And you address that in one of your videos. And 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 he can be very blunt, like when he said to George Martin, I don't like your tie. What do you think about that side of George? Does that make you like him less or more? It makes me like him more. I love the duality of George because I think like it's almost like, you know, within you, without you, where at the end he has the laughter and it's kind of like Mm -hmm. him recognizing like, yeah, I know you're laughing at me and like, it's okay. I don't really care that much. Like I loved, I love that part of his attitude where he can be very soulful and very thoughtful and very compassionate, but he can also be like I've said in some videos, like bitchy or salty and I think yes. that's and that he is you know recognizing that it owns it like like he talked a lot about being a Pisces fish and having two sides of who you are and they're both you they're both real um one doesn't you know outdo the other or negate the other and I love that about George and I think too with his place in the Beatles you know sometimes maybe not being listened to as much or you know like being the kid who you know mm-hmm just kind of sit down and play guitar. Like, I think that kind of attitude would make sense. Like, and get back a lot of his little quips or, you know, when he seems a little feisty, it makes sense. It's like, you know, after so long of maybe kind of getting towards the end of your rope, you're going to be a little snappy and you're going to be a little bit like, well, what about this? Or like, forget about that part. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, and I think I like that he's kind and compassionate and that that's real, but then he's also sometimes fed up and sometimes annoyed and like that's also real and so I love I love those two sides of him and that they're both equally George now even further with George and more recently I read that he was quite a womanizer he even had a fling with Madonna rumored had not not proven what do you think about that because I know you address male and female roles on your TikTok site as well what do you think of that Yeah, I think being a fan of the Beatles is kind of a weird sensation, you know, again, versus like Harry Styles, like a current person who like right now we don't have any, we don't know anything like bad that they've done versus like all four of the Beatles are like, they're either abusers, cheaters or both. And it's like, as a fan, you do just kind of have to sit with that and you can't excuse it and you can't be like, well, no, it's not real. Like you have to address it. Um, but also, you know, maybe not let it could become the whole view of who they are. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I am sometimes like, you know, especially with George and Patty, you know, I think a lot of people like to go to Patty. It's like, well, she cheated on him and, you know, it's her fault, but it's like, well, he was cheating on her all the time probably too. And so it's like, I think it is interesting to, to think about the time that they all lived in and like if they had lived today would they have been better partners maybe maybe not um but yeah i think i'm able to kind of sit with that part of george without trying to like wash it away with but also not letting it be like oh i can't like you at all because you were sometimes unfaithful you know um again because like all four of them were sometimes bad to their partners and that's yeah, just something you have to sit with and and it's part of being a fan. Um, and so it is interesting that way versus like a contemporary fandom. All right. So that's that's very good. You're you're a non-judgmental person. That's a good thing. You're you're a worthy fan of George and the Beatles, if I could say that. Who am I to say that anyway? Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> um, 
Let's talk about a pet peeve of mine, fall McCartney. I'm sure you've seen that address, the rumors that never oh. die due to a Beatles joke that they did back in the 60s. There are thousands of crazy people, and the, I am making a judgment here, who think that Paul McCartney died in 1966. Drives me absolutely, I don't know why it bothers me. It's not about me, but what do you think about this? Does it bother you the way it bothers me, all that stuff? I think it just makes me laugh because it's almost like if you do honestly think he died in 66, then like the Paul afterwards did like a really good job, maybe even a better job than the first one in terms of genre, you know, so it's kind of funny to if it was like if people thought he died in like 1980, you know, then it's like, oh, yeah, like, you know, it's just funny to me that that year specifically, too, it's like, oh, well, then he did a really good job if he is a duplicate, you know, but no, I definitely I, I, I don't believe it, obviously, um, yeah. but I, I guess it doesn't bother me. I do just kind of think it's funny where it's like, okay, like if, cause I don't think I meet too many people who say it, who legitimately wholeheartedly believe it with their whole soul. I think like a lot of conspiracy theories, sometimes it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I believe that I really don't, but it's fun to say I do. And so, um, right. yeah, I think, the one there's just one there's one Paul and that's it. Um, but right. it's funny that he has to kind of have that rumor chasing him his whole life. Doesn't bother him. He he gets a yeah. kick out of it too. So <laughs> I guess that's the right attitude, and I got to get over it. <laughs> but anyway, your podcast. Tell how viewers and listeners can listen to your podcast. Do you have video on your podcast as well? We just have audio, um, but yeah, it's just called Apple Scruffs. Um, it, again, it's with uh, Layla Ortiz and Skylar Moody, who are both also Beatle TikTokers. And um, yeah, we've, we're having our third episode come out tomorrow, uh, July 22nd. And so I'll be talking a little bit more about staying at George's house. Uh, they both saw Ringo and Paul last month. Um, Skylar went to May Payne's film premiere about um, her weekend with John Lennon and so uh, or the lost weekend period and so um yeah we are we're on Spotify Apple podcasts and yeah you can hear us talk a little bit we do an episode about once a month and so you can just hear us talk about the Beatles yeah and the Beatle maniacs we do it once a month too except mine my guys are have all different schedules so we're kind of more easy going in the summer and and I'm I'm the only nut keep go, that keeps going. <laughs> well, Katie, yeah, thank you yeah. so much for being on the show, and yeah. I'm, I hope you'll be back. Maybe when different issues come up, we can get together again. Or if you want me to get, I them, love that. I'll come on yours. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been really awesome. And I'm going to edit this down to you know different segments. I was a little self indulgent in you know just because we never talked before it's fun to get to know a person yeah. and then yeah. uh, you know but part, uh, don't worry i'm a good editor I'll, I'll know what parts to leave in now if there's any shots that you want me to put in visuals um oh, yeah. you can send me those to my email and yeah. let's see what else um yeah that's it yeah yeah so, i can definitely send that to you great i hope this was fun for you it was. it was. It was always fun to talk about the Beatles, so it, I really appreciate it. It really is. It really is. Well, take care of yourself, and uh, great to meet you, and I will be following your TikTok. Thank I have you. a TikTok, but I, I've never posted a video on TikTok, and I'm a video guy. Do you edit right in your phone? I do. I've heard that it's better to use, like, other um, editors, but I just do it on TikTok. You do and, an amazing yeah. job. I, oh, thank you. I'm old school. I predate computers with my editing, so I need my computer to spread out. I don't know how yeah. people do this. Like, it's a, you do everything that I can do on a computer, so you're doing the right thing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's tough sometimes. It's like the little nitpicky things like, oh, that it's like a half second too early, you know, but it's, it's been fun. It's going to it's going to cut me off any second. So take care, Thank Katie. You. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.